I'm going to be solving Laplace's equation in two dimensions using the method of separation of variables for the problem with the given boundary conditions. Now I have already written out the entire solution only because this video would be incredibly long otherwise. And so I will point and talk through it, but I will cover all the mathematical steps required, including determining the sign of the separation constant, solving the differential equations we obtain, and deriving the formula for the Fourier coefficient, and finding the Fourier coefficient. Okay, and the method of separation of variables is a common method used to solve uh, partial differential equations, such as the heat equation, the wave equation, or in this case, Laplace's equation. So here are our four boundary conditions. And so I drew this picture in the x, y, and plane here so we can visualize these boundary conditions. So here's Laplace's equation in 2D, and it is the second partial derivative with respect to x plus the second partial with respect to y equals zero, where v is the potential function. Okay, and so you can see here we're trying to find the potential in the shaded region inside of this rectangle. Um, and so the potential on the bottom and on the top of the rectangle is zero, given by the first two boundary conditions. And the potential on the sides is V naught, which is a constant given by the second two boundary conditions. Okay, and so the separation of variables method, what it states is we're assuming that our potential, V of XY, our solution, is of the form where X and Y are the independent variables. And so what we're saying is we're gonna take V of X, Y, and we're gonna separate it into two functions that are multiplied together where each um, is a function of one of the independent variables. And so let me give you an example really quickly of that. So here we have F of X, Y, um, where the independent variables are X and Y, and I've written down a function here, let's say two X squared times Y. And so if I, uh, factor out here the, the terms that are functions of x and the terms that are functions of y. We get these two terms here. Um, and if you multiply them together, you come back to the original function. So this function is separable in the form we just described. Now, of course, not every function can be separated into this form. So why do we want to use this method? And why are we justified in assuming a solution of that form? Well. The reason is Laplace's equation has a uniqueness theorem that states if you find a solution that satisfies Laplace's equation, then it is in fact the unique solution for the given boundary conditions. And so what does that mean? That means we are justified in making this assumption or this guess of the form of our solution. And if it leads to an answer that satisfies our PDE, then that is the unique answer for our problem with these boundary conditions. Okay. And so we're looking for a general solution here. And so it'll turn out uh, that our solution is going to be an infinite series, which will converge to our potential function v of x, y, that will in fact satisfy Laplace's equation. So that's why we're justified in using uh, the separation of variables method. Okay, so let's dive right into our problem here. So if we take our function, our solution, and we sub it into Laplace's equation, we will get this equation here. Okay, we had two derivatives to, uh, with respect to x, two plus two derivatives with respect to y equals zero. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to divide this equation by x times y. And you can see I dropped the function of the notation to uh, simplify moving forward. Um, and so I'm gonna divide both sides here by x times y. And so the y's will cancel here and we'll be left with x prime over x. The x will cancel here. We'll be left with y prime over y and zero divided by x times y is zero. Now, why did I do this? So the first term has only x's, the second term has only y's. Now I'm gonna subtract y over to the other side, and so we'll get x double prime over x equal negative y double prime over y, and this must be equal to a constant, which I'm gonna call lambda. And so you can see that this must be true because here we are, have second derivative with respect to x, and here the second derivative with respect to y, and if one side changes, then it can't be equal to the other side because if one side changes, it affects the other side. And so both sides have to be equal to a constant for this equation to be true, okay? And so we're going to assume that this constant, I'm going to rewrite it, I'm going to actually define it here, define it as mu squared, where mu is positive. And so after I solve these, uh, these two ODEs we're about to obtain, we'll come back up and we'll talk about why 
I, I chose to define that constant in such a way, okay? So let's get started. So if I cover up one term here, we obtain one ODE. If I cover up the other term, we obtain another ODE. So I've written them down here. One ODE only depends on X. The other ODE only depends on Y. So this is why these, what we did is we essentially broke down our PDE into two ordinary differential equations that we know how to solve. So they're second order linear homogeneous differential equations. Okay, and so I'm gonna quickly go through and get our solutions for those. And if you don't know that, you can uh, search the method for solving those types of problems, but I'm not gonna cover it in detail here. And so we're going to assume a solution for this first one. We're gonna start with x of the form e to the rt. So sub that in, take two derivatives here, sub it in here, and we're gonna get this characteristic equation that I'll simplify down to. So r is plus or minus mu. And so then we'll get this final form, which is a solution of exponentials, okay? And so same thing over here, assume a solution of e to the rt. We'll sub that in and we'll get the characteristic equation r squared plus mu squared equals zero, where r is plus or minus i mu. And we'll get this solution here, which uh, is a solution, which is a combination of uh, cosines and sines. Okay, and then we're gonna now apply uh, the boundary conditions, which come from here. So the x boundary conditions, we have b and negative b, which are equal to the constants v naught. So let's apply those. So x of b, uh, so we sub b into the x terms and we'll get this equation. And then we'll do negative b, sub those in and get this equation. And so since these are both equal to v naught, we could set these two equal to each other. And if we solve for c1 or c2, we'll actually end up getting c1 is equal to c2, which I'm just gonna rename as the constant a. So you can pause the video and try that for yourself if you can't um, just see it by inspection there. And so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna rewrite our solution, uh, redefining both these constants as a. And so I get this form here, then I will factor out an a, and then I'm going to rewrite this inside term here, this combina linear combination of exponentials as uh, two times the hyperbolic cosine of mu x. Now, why can I do that? Well, a hyperbolic cosine is defined for the hyperbolic cosine of mu x is defined as e to the mu x plus e to the minus mu x over 2. So from that definition of hyperbolic cosine, we can just simplify down our problem by rewriting this expression here uh, of exponentials in terms of this hyperbolic cosine. Okay, and so now what we'll do is we'll go over and we'll apply the boundary conditions uh, to the y, okay? So we have zero and a, which are both equal to zero. So here they are. So when we sub in zero, we'll get c3 cosine of zero plus c4 sine of zero equals zero. Now, sine of zero is zero, so this term goes away. Cosine of zero is one, and so we're left with c3 equals zero, okay? So now, when we go to apply the second boundary condition, y of a, I'm gonna just discard that cosine term because the coefficient is zero. And so we'll have c4 times sine of mu a equals zero. Now c4 can't be zero, even though it will satisfy this equation because then if c3 and c4 is zero, then our y equation is zero and that's just the trivial solution and uh, that's not gonna be particularly useful. We know the trivial solution will satisfy Laplace's equation, but of course, if the y is zero and then the v of x, y is zero, which does satisfy the equation, but it's not, it's not the solution we're looking for, okay? So we wanna avoid trivial solutions, which we'll come back and talk about when we talk about why we're choosing uh, lambda to be defined as it is, okay? And so what that means is we need the sine term to be zero, and the only way to do that is let mu equals n pi over a. So if you were to sub that in, the a's will cancel and we're left with sine of n pi, where n is any positive integer. And so the sine of any positive integer multiple of pi is zero. So this works out. And so what we can say then is I'm just gonna rename c4 as b. And so now we have the solution of x and the solution of y. And so we can bring them back in here, multiply them, and we get, the, we get the expression for v of xy, the potential function we're looking for, okay? And so what I did is 2a is a constant, b is a constant, you multiply them, they make a new constant, I renamed it as c, okay? And so something we'll note, 
that if I sub in our mu, now my expression for v of x, y is dependent on n, where n is that any positive integer. So what that means is we have an infinite number of solutions that satisfy Laplace's equation for every positive integer. And so I'm just going to call v of x, y, v n of x, y, because it's dependent on n. And so what we actually need to get our final solution is take the linear combination of all possible solutions. Okay. Whoops. Made a little mistake there. So this now is v of x, y. And so what we're doing is we're going to sum from n equals 1 to infinity um, of our vn function. Okay? So I wrote that down right here. So our formal solution here is we're summing over all values of n um, for this vn of functions. It's a linear combination for every value of n. So this this, this uh, infinite series here converges to the potential function we're looking for. Okay? Now, you'll notice I started this at 1. Why? Because if I started it at 0, then we'd have sine of 0, so this whole thing is 0. And so it works if you start at 0, but you might as well just start it at 1 if 0 is going to give you a trivial solution. Okay? But it wouldn't matter because it would be 0 plus and then the 1 term on. Okay? So we can write this... Uh, starting at whatever we want, but I'm doing one just for uh, convenience, okay? And so now what we need to find is we need to find uh, C, this constant, and we'll do that by doing some Fourier analysis. So what I'm going to do then is, oh, before I do the Fourier analysis, we're going to come back up and we're going to talk about why I chose uh, lambda as I did. So let's talk about that real quick. And so what we're going to do is you want to check all three of these cases. You're going to check, uh, let mu be positive, negative, and zero. Now, you do enough of these problems that it turns out that you can pretty much just go jump right to these x solutions, right to these y solutions. Like, I will see something of this form, and I know it's exponentials. I'll see something in this form. I know it's sines and cosines. Um, and you'll look at your boundary conditions and go, hmm, what lambda, what sine of lambda must I choose such that I know my solution is going to make sense with these boundary conditions? That's, that's where you're uh, applying physical intuition to justify what you're doing. Like if I give you a boundary condition that says um, as x goes to infinity, the potential drops off to infinity. You're going to do this inspection to determine um, what sign you're going to choose for this lambda. But... To do it mathematically and formally, we're going, to have, we're going to test all three of these cases. So I only did one example where I test the case where lambda, or for this case mu, is negative, and I'm doing it for the y equation, which is here. Okay, And so if we do that, then I'm going to get y double prime minus lambda y equals 0, which is of this form. So I know my solution is, a, is of exponentials. Okay. So we apply our boundary conditions, and we'll see that e, uh, e to the 0 is 1, and so we're going to get for y0, c3 plus c4 is 0, so c3 is negative c4. We apply ya, and we'll get this equation. I'm going to sub in for c3, negative c4, okay? And now the exponentials can't be 0 to equal the 0, right? If you look at the graph of the exponential, it never is 0, okay? It is a horizontal asymptote at 0, and so... That means C4 must be 0. And if C4 is 0, then C3 is 0, and we have a trivial solution. And we want to avoid trivial solutions. That's the same reason why I didn't let C4 be 0 uh, when we were solving uh, this ODE here. Okay? And so this is, the, this is the process you would do if you can't just from intuition determine the sign. What you're trying to do is you want to determine the sign so that your solution with the given boundary conditions does not lead to the trivial solution. Okay. So now let's find uh, this coefficient c. And so to do that, what we're going to do here is, so vn of by 
is the VN that we have here, but I'm using this boundary condition. So I'm going to take this VN, I'm going to sub in X equal B, and then set this whole thing equal to V naught. Okay, that is what I did here. So I'm applying the boundary condition to this VN term. And so what we said earlier was that our final function, V of X, Y, is equal to the, the, the sum over all the VN, the linear combination of all of these solutions. And so then we apply our boundary condition. And so then we go look down here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both sides by this sine term. Okay? And, and you'll get better by looking at your VN to choosing uh, which term to multiply by, sine, cosine, or whatever function happens to be useful for finding your coefficients. Um, so this just comes from doing multiple problems over and over. Or you could just try one and see what works. And so you can use the, the formulas. We're gonna, you can look up these formulas for Fourier coefficients for the Fourier series. And so I'm just going through the derivation of how you would get this, though. So you multiply both sides by sine. And then we're going to integrate both sides from 0 to A, which is our period. It's defined here from the boundary conditions for a rectangle. Okay. And so I'm integrating term-wise for this series. And then so it turns out this integral of sine squared here is A over 2. And so I'm going to divide both sides by A over 2. And we're left with this final expression. C times the hyperbolic cosine of n pi b over A is all one constant. And so we can find that constant by evaluating this integral. So here we go. So I wrote this down. This is a constant. So you, this whole expression here is equal to v naught. So we could find this constant by evaluating that integral, which turns out to be 4 v naught over n pi for odd n's and 0 for even n's. So our final solution is the sum over odd n's of, and what we're going to do is we want to sub c in here. So we're going to divide this 4 v naught over n pi by this hyperbolic cosine to get c and then sub it up in here. And so we have the 4 v naught over n pi, hyperbolic cosine of n pi x over a, divided by hyperbolic cosine of n pi b over a, times the sine of n pi y over a. And this is the solution to Laplace's equation for our given boundary conditions.